75% keyboards have taken over the world in the last year and a half. That's just a fact. And let's face it, it's a good layout. It has all the basics plus an afro, and that seems to be the sweet spot for the majority, since it meets both people coming from larger and smaller layouts right in the middle. But while the 75% layout is here to stay, that will not stop people from trying to evolve this form factor. And today we have one of those attempts, the hot swappable Zenast Element 75 XT, which as the name implies, extends the 75% layout with an extra row of macro keys, as a nod to some vintage keyboard layouts from the PCAT and XT era that were known to employ left side function keys. After using this prototype for about a month, I'm ready to share my views on this layout usefulness, the ideas and concepts behind this design, as well as its build quality and other choices made by this keyboard's designers for its upcoming crowdfunding campaign. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Bring your next product to market with PCBWay's OEM and contract manufacturing services. Check the link in the description below for more information. Hello and welcome to IOSAM. I am Sam Franco and this is a channel where I do tech reviews and show you how to build, fix and mod all sorts of computer gear. Today we are checking out the Element 75 XT from a newcomer to the semi-custom keyboard scene, the Singapore-based Zenist, a late 2022 crowdfunding project aiming to secure a minimum production run of 200 units of this roughly 310 US dollars fully assembled keyboard that will include switches, keycaps and an extra FR4 plate besides the case, aluminum plate and PCB. This is a hot swappable gasket mounted CNC aluminum keyboard sporting an extended 75% layout with a knob that is QMK and VIA compatible and that will ship with both aluminum and FR4 plates. It does offer all the basics we come to expect from custom and semi-custom keyboards in this price range in 2022 such as plate PCB assembly isolation, south facing switch sockets, RGB backlighting, and quality metal construction. As this is a crowdfunded project, I'll have a rather important disclaimer about group buys and crowdfunding projects in the conclusion chapter of this video that you should definitely check out if you're new to the custom keyboards hobby. As for the Element 75 XT in particular, Zenas sent me this prototype free of any cost for the sole purpose of reviewing it and providing the project runners with valuable feedback for things they could improve in its product's design. But as my viewers already know by now, my reviews are never dictated or influenced by manufacturers, resellers or PR teams. I will place affiliate links for some of the parts and tools we'll use in this video for your convenience that can also generate revenue to support this channel. But that does not influence my views and opinions here. The Zenast Element 75 XT is based on an exploded 75% layout, but with an added left side single column. It is an USB-C wired only south facing hot swappable keyboard with a gasket mounted plate encased in a CNC machined 6063 aluminum alloy case that will only be offered in black in its first run. The project runner stated that for the full price of 449 Singapore dollars, which is roughly 310 US dollars when this video is being recorded, you get the Element 75 XT fully assembled with JWIC switches and die sub PBT keycap set and chair profile designed specifically for this board. Although at this time, I don't have a final word on the keycaps color schemes. In the box, you also get an USB-C cable that was not provided with my prototype and also both an aluminum and an FR4 plates. In this video, I'll show only the aluminum and a polycarbonate prototype though, since Zenas did not provide me a copy of their FR4 plate. You'll also get pre-lubed and pre-installed PCB screw mounted stabs, but Zenas could not specify who will be the supplier of those stabs. But if they stick to the ones included in this prototype, that will be nice, since those are very good. The PCB has five pin south facing hot swappable sockets with RGB illumination that can be fully programmed through QMK and VIA. Since this is a hot swappable board, you don't have the option to change the NC only layout you get here. When asked about what will be their policy regarding DOA or damaged units during shipping, they confirmed they will have extras to replace those in case anyone gets a non-working or damaged product out of the box. The layout here is obviously the star of the show and possibly the main reason why anyone would want to buy this keyboard in the first place. While just adding an extra column sounds like a trivial thing, I believe Zenest did better than that here. First, they move the volume knob to the left top corner when compared to most popular 75%, which opens the top right corner to have three more keys placed there in comparison to the GMMK Pro, for example. After squeezing the F-roll blocks closer together, 
which I don't mind. And I really like those changes, since now you can have 12 of the standard 13 navigation keys from a TKL on that side. Considering I never had a use for the pause key, 12 keys is all I really need. And then, on the left side, you get 5 extra keys under the knob, or 4 if you bring the escape key down there to preserve the tilde key as I did on mine. The idea here is to allow you to place macros or remap those keys any way you like through QMK and VIA. While not everybody relies on macros for their workflows, truth is anyone can make use of those extra keys for gaming, spreadsheet work, image and video editing, or even to place some quick shortcuts and other desktop related tasks. And a left side column is the perfect placement for macros anyway, since it would not take away mouse space on the right side of the board for the vast majority of people. This is something we've seen many times already, from vintage keyboards all the way to more modern gaming layouts. It is already a tried and true thing. As for having the rotary encoder on the top left side, I actually prefer it there than on the top right corner, since it allows me to use it without lifting my hand from the mouse. And because this board is QMK and VIA compatible, you can use the rotary encoder not only as a volume knob, but also with other navigation and backlighting functions, which immediately makes it much more useful than the one on the GMMK Pro, for example since here you have more than one function for the knob when used with multiple layers. If you are an entrepreneur in the market for a reliable OEM or contract manufacturing partner to help you bring your next product design to life, did you know PCBWay has exactly what you're looking for? If you have a design for lighting, security or medical equipment, home or kitchen appliances, or other types of electronics, PCBWay can manufacture your product under your specifications and help you to bring your creations to market quicker and with higher quality. All while enjoying the flexibility and cost savings that are only possible through OEM economies of scale in PCB production and assembly, injection molding, CNC machining, and sheet metal fabrication. With 11 factories and over 2,800 employees, as well as access to the best component suppliers in the industry, PCBWay is a uniquely qualified one-stop shop that can assist you through the entire process of designing, manufacturing, testing and packing fully assembled devices that are ready for shipment. Check out the link in the description below for more information and OEM case studies, or to contact PCBWay's team of engineers, designers and production specialists for a quote. And thanks to PCBWay for their support of this channel and the Mechanical Keyboards Enthusiast community. Now, let's go through this keyboard's parts, features and design, as well as its build quality. In regards to its build quality, though, I have to preamble this section by disclaiming this review unit is a prototype that has been handled by a lot of people before it got to me. And as a result, it arrived with some scuff marks and dents that you obviously should not get on the final product. While I'll point out some of these things, I'm obviously giving Zenas the benefit of the doubt here and would not pin these to lack of QC on their part. The case design is simple and subdued. No crazy lines, curves, lights, or accents of any kind except the simple element in the bottom that we'll get to in a minute. The anodization is at the same level of what you get on a GMMK Pro, which is to say it is very good. A bit grainy, but with no stains, streaks, or discolorations anywhere I could find. But unlike the Jim K Pro that had its case cast, this one is CNC'd, which is a bit nicer in my opinion. Although, as I mentioned earlier, my unit suffered from some rough manhandling before it got to me, which is very unfortunate and something buyers of the final product will hopefully not experience with their brand new units. The knob here is on the left side, which I like since I set mine to side scrolling, which means I can scroll vertically with my right hand on the mouse and horizontally with my left hand on the keyboard. Zen S will add a knob in the color of the element you pick for your board, which means the knob and the bottom plate will have the same color, which can be red, yellow, silver or blue. Although the knob here didn't feel particularly nice to me, a bit on the small side and the lack of knurling or any type of texture makes it feel a bit bland. But because the rotary encoder uses a circular 6mm stem, it is not hard to find aftermarket replacements, as we'll see in the modding chapter. The screws used here are hex for the bottom half of the case and Phillips for everything else inside of the case. Overall, no quality issues with any of those screws here. Zen has told me they will include a hex screwdriver in the kit in case you want to open the case for modding, which is nice. Now, it is hard not to see the similarities between this case design and the GMMK Pros, since not only the lines, typing angle, and the general shape of the top and bottom halves are very similar, but even things like the position of the USB-C daughterboard and the gasket mounting system used here 
were designed with the same basic elements, if you discount the obvious size differences. Which means this board, at least in its stock configuration, with its included thick case foam, also offers very little flex and definitely no bounce, just like the GMMK Pro. As we'll discuss later, I don't find that to be a problem for my particular type and style, but we'll go through some suggested changes here that can add a bit more flex to this design for those who need it. But the good news here for most folks is that the Element 75 XT most definitely sounds better and louder than the GMMK Pro, as we'll hear in the typing test chapter. As for the visual distinctions besides the layout, we have the small chamfer, slightly curved corners, and the higher profile that better hides the switches in most angles. The USB-C socket is not too deep into the bottom half of the case, but since the top half overhangs the bottom by 3.5 millimeters, the metal prong is not exposed. That also ensures you'll be able to use cables with virtually any plug size here, which is great. As I mentioned before, the only visual flare you get here is in the bottom, where you will be able to choose between four plates with the four elements engraved in four different colors. Silver for air, blue for water, red for fire, and yellow for earth. It is important to mention though that these plates don't add any weight, since they're made out of the same material than the keyboard, aluminium. So this is exclusively a visual flair thing and not a practical design choice. The designs look really nice in my opinion, but Zenas told me they will change the tone of the yellow plate to a less saturated color than the one I have here. Now, this is one of those decorative things that keyboard designers feel compelled to do these days because it seems the community likes it. Me, being the old school keyboard guy I am, would never complain about a keyboard in this price range not having some nice design on the bottom, where you obviously will never look at it while using it. But okay, I get it, I get it. You guys like it. So there you have it. The Element 75 XT's PCB uses south facing KO 5 pins compatible sockets with per key SMD LEDs with a JST connector to a USB C daughter board. This board is wired only, and its daughter board seems to be of the AI03 unified standard. You do get N-key rollover and QMK NVIDIA compatibility, which is nice. One glaring design flaw in this particular prototype was the location of the daughter board JST socket that was placed in a way that it gets blocked by a switch hot swap socket. That meant I had to remove each wire individually here when trying to mod this board and then hot glue them back to the plug afterwards which is obviously not something end users should have to deal with. But Zenas told me the final product will have this issue fixed for sure. As far as the RGB, while this board does offer it, it will be one of those cases where it will probably make no difference depending on the switches and keycaps you use. With the Gateron Oil Kings I'm using here, there's basically no lights visible, since the switch does not have an opening for RGB lights to come through. But if you're like me, and depending on your use case, you might not care too much about the lackluster backlighting in these types of keyboard configurations. In both my home office and bedroom setup, I use these types of desk lights that you mount on top of your monitor, and that can shine a soft light directly on your keyboard and mouse area, such as the BenQ Screen Bar Plus I'm showing here. This lamp is super simple to install, becoming basically invisible after mounted, and yet it can shine as much light as you need directly where it matters, without any glare or obfuscation visible bulbs that can blind you. The BenQ screen bar has this convenient remote control with a dial that allows you to adjust brightness and color temperature, plus a smart function that will read the amount of light in your room and automatically provide the ideal brightness level with a single push of a button. This is a really classy solution for late night typing or gaming. If you happen to go with fully translucent switches, such as Gateron North Pole, TTC Ice Candy, or Everglide Aqua King, then you still get a nice underglow with the Element 75 XT, since its LEDs are some of the brightest I have ever seen in any keyboard when set to their maximum brightness. Another good thing about the backlighting here is that you get full control through via, which is great and something we sometimes don't get on some via compatible keyboards, such as the KBD Fans KBD67 Lite, for example. Since this is a QMK and via compatible keyboard, the software configuration side is well taken care of. Course. Although this board has not been approved yet by the big kahunas who control the via user interface, which means at this point, you have to manually load the Zenest provided JSON file every time you need to reconfigure this board on VIA. But even with that annoyance for the time being, I'm still more than happy to use VIA to remap keys, to configure backlighting, and the Element 75 XT's main feature the macro keys on the left side column. VIA also gives you a bit more options to configure the rotary encoder here, other than audio volume such as to set lighting options or to give it navigation functions, for example. 
Although here you don't get the choice to configure the knob press, which I'm not sure if this is a problem with this particular JSON file or if it is indeed a limitation of the VIA interface. But I suspect you might be able to fix that by reprogramming the board directly through QMK. My sample came with very thick plate and case foam sheets, which work very well to kill most pink sounds here as we'll hear on the typing tests. Although I suspect this would be a factor in reducing plate flex in this design, so I tried this board with a much thinner 0.8 mm pour-on sheet in the case's bottom instead of the stock 3 mm one, as we'll see in the money chapter, which also had a slight effect in this keyboard sound as we'll hear in the typing test. But overall, I did like the stock sound of this board very much. And if you don't care for plate flex, you might not need to change anything in its stock design. As a gasket mounted plate keyboard, here you get the vibration free typing experience we come to expect out of this type of design which is always appreciated, of course, since killing metal on metal friction and vibration is essential to improve the sound of this type of board and is the number one reason to have gaskets in a keyboard to begin with. But as I mentioned before, the Element 75 XT does not offer a lot of plate flex in its stock design with the aluminum plate. As those who have been watching my videos for a while already know, I don't particularly care too much for excessive plate flex, since I'm not a heavy typist that requires lots of shock absorption on my keyboards. And I actually dislike bouncy plates that detract from my typing experience, since I feel like the keys are never in a constant position for every keystroke, which messes up with my typing muscle memory. People are different, and they have different preferences for these things. I know it is a mechanical keyboard's dogma nowadays to think that every keyboard should be a trampoline, but I simply beg to differ. And I know I'm not alone in this camp, since most people I know who type with all 10 fingers and proper technique are not too crazy about excessive plate flex and bounce. I also know quite a few gamers that dislike bouncy plates, since they say that it throws off their precision when quickly moving and strafing on FPS games. This is indeed 100% personal preference, and while springy plates is heralded as gospel in the custom keyboards community, this is not something everybody wants, despite what most keyboard influencers out there would have you believe. So right out of the gate, I would not recommend this keyboard with its stock aluminum plate to those who want bouncy keyboards. For those, I suggest you go with one of KBD Fan's spring leaf mounted boards that will give you exactly what you're looking for in that regard. At any rate, there are a few things you can make to slightly increase the flexibility of the stock plate as we'll see later. The stock plate is made out of aluminum and while Zen S did send me a polycarbonate plate prototype to try, they confirmed to me later that the polycarbonate option will no longer be available in the first run of this board. They decided to replace it for an FR4 plate that will be included in the box for its targeted 310 US dollars price and which I did not receive with my sample, so I could not test it in this video. As we'll see later, the polycarbonate plate does offer quite a lot of flex, so the decision to not offer it might disappoint the trampoline gang out there. But at least you should still get far more plate flex with the FR4 option than with the stock aluminum one, of course. The plate attaches to the PCB through nine screws in all the right places, which is enough to ensure you're not going to have any difficulties installing switches or having them popping off their sockets when typing, which is always a possibility when the plate and the hot swap PCB don't have enough attachment points between them. The plate has six winglets, three on the north and three on the south sides that make contact with the gaskets on the bottom and the top case halves. My prototype came with three millimeter pour on gaskets that did not match the size of the gasket supports on the bottom case. So I replaced them for properly sized gasket strips here. But Zen S said the final version will come with properly sized gaskets already pre-installed. The board uses PCB mounted stabs and this prototype came with screw mounted housings that look like Duroc V1s. While Zen S did not confirm the manufacturer of these stabs, they are pretty good and don't require clipping. Although they came lubed with a thin lubricant that didn't do much in terms of quieting rattling. So I ended up removing the stock lube and replaced it with my own Crytox mix in the housings and stems and Crytox XHT BDZ in the wire tips. I also added KBD Fan's rubber pads under the housings to reduce the bottom out noise a bit. My prototype sample did not come with any switches or keycaps, but Zen S said they will include JWIC black linear switches and die sublimated PBT keycaps in the box. For this review, I used the only keycap set I had with enough novelty caps to fill the macro column with profile correct keys. Drops GMK Red Samurai in this dark red and cinder with yellow legends and accents. 
This, by the way, will be your main challenge when populating the macro column of a keyboard with this type of layout with aftermarket sets, since most keycap kits don't have macro keys or enough novelties in the correct row profiles to fill those five positions. You'll have to most likely buy some novelty add-on kits or fill them up with artisans or relegendables. But I gotta say, the Samurai set looked phenomenal on this blackboard. The keyboard measures 36.3 centimeters in width, which is equivalent to a TKL size, 13.7 centimeters in depth, 2.2 centimeters in height on the front side, and 3.6 centimeters in height on the back side. The inclination angle is five degrees when measured on top of the third row of cherry profile keycaps. The keyboard weights 2.1 kilograms, or four pounds and one ounce when assembled with switches and keycaps. As for the looks, I'd say that if you like the trendy exploded 75% out there, there's a good chance this will appeal to you. One could even argue that the extra column on the left side ends up bringing some balance to the popular 75% layout, since it makes it look a bit more proportional by counterbalancing the navigation column on the right. As for the case color, this first round will be black only, which is the obvious color to pick if you offer only one option, since black keyboard cases are by far the easiest ones to match with keycaps of any color. But depending on the success for the first round, I'm sure Zenith will consider bringing additional options in future batches. All right, so let's hear how the Zenith Element 75 XT sounds in its stock configuration with its thick case and plate foam sheets with the aluminum plate. For switches, I'm using Gateron Oil Kings, which are factory lubed, but that I also manually lubed its springs with my Crytox mix. And for keycaps, I'm going with Drops GMK Red Samurai. The Element 75 XT has a pretty balanced sound profile in its stock mode. Not too loud, not too muted, not too clacky. Although you get very little of the desirable low frequency sounds outside the top and bottom rows, which can be difficult to achieve with perfect consistency on metal boards with plenty of foam like this one. My only issue with the stock sound is a bit of case pain, which is particularly perceptible with the space bar. But overall, this keyboard stock sound is pretty good for a full metal build in this price range. Certainly louder with much more pop than we got from the muted GMMK Pro and the extremely pingy key crown Q1. As for the typing feel, you get a pretty uniform experience in the alphas, since the aluminum plate moves more or less uniformly in the vertical axis between the top and bottom gaskets, which is a good thing in my book, since I usually prefer that over keyboards where you have a noticeably softer flexi spot in the middle of the plate. As previously explained, in its stock form, there is basically no noticeable plate flex here when typing. After typing on the Element 75 XT with Gateron Oil King switches and GMK ABS keycaps, I can honestly say that the stock typing experience is not too far from what I expect out of a keyboard in this price range, and thus, I could totally use it in stock form. But for the sake of showing to those who like a bit more plate movement and a bit more sound volume out of their keyboards, there are a few mods I can suggest here. Replacing the thick 3mm stock case foam sheet for a much thinner 0.8mm one, and then insulate the inner bottom side of the case with a couple of layers of masking tape, as well as applying a force break or O-ring mod between the two case halves. The thinner foam will give you about two extra millimeters of space under the PCB, allowing it to flex a bit more and allowing more sound to resonate inside of the case, thus increasing the sound volume. The tape applied to the bottom case here has a different goal than when applying to the bottom of the PCB. Tape on the PCB usually changes the sound and the volume, since it helps the sound to bounce through the plate without letting higher frequencies to travel inside of the case. But applying the tape to the bottom case instead just helps to reduce the metal resonance or ping when the sound traveling inside manages to hit the aluminum on the other side of the thinner foam sheet, like the one I'm using here since this aluminum bottom half might not be heavy enough to prevent resonance on its own. I also did a force break mod here by applying some stick glue to tiny pieces of silicon tape 
and then placing them around the screw holes so they get sandwiched by the two halves of the case. This helps to isolate the two case halves, further reducing ping noises. Another option here would be to use rubber O-rings around the screws, the same way I did to my GMMK Pro, as I showed in my review of that board, which will have the same effect here in the sound and also in the plate flex. Considering the similarity of the designs between the Element 75 XD and the GMMK Pro, that makes total sense, of course. If you go with 1mm O-rings, you end up increasing the distance between the two case halves, which will in turn increase the space for the plate to move up and down between the gaskets, resulting in a bit more plate flex. I did not remove the foam between the plate and the PCB, simply because removing it wouldn't change much in the typing feel, but might bring more ping noises, which I would rather avoid. Other than that, the only other thing I changed here was the knob, which I picked the super high quality one from DigiKey that has a compatible 6mm wide shaft and is 100% metal inside and out and has a nice texture to it. Because this knob does not have a soft plastic fitting inside, it relies on a screw to firmly secure it to the rotary encoder stand. So let's check out how the Zenast Element 75 XT sounds now with the thinner case foam and the stock aluminium plate with tape bottom case and force brake mod. As a bonus comparison, I also added an extra configuration with factory lubed Everglide Aqua King linear switches, which I also lubed its springs with my Crytox mix and the polycarbonate plate with 1mm O-rings sandwiched between the two halves of the case. Okay, the first thing I noticed on the modded board with the aluminium plate was a sharper and slightly louder sound, but with less ping, which is good. But as far as the typing feel goes, the difference between the stock and the modded versions of this board with the aluminium plate is quite small. If you type with more force, you might be able to tell them apart, but if you're a light-handed typist like me, you might miss it. Now, the huge difference here was with the polycarbonate plate with the O-rings mod. The overall sound volume was reduced by quite a lot, but not in a muted way. What I got here was a lower frequency, softer sound that honestly sounds a lot more pleasant than with the aluminium plate. Here, even with the same thin foam and no tape on the bottom case, I got virtually no ping, which was a clear effect of the better isolation provided by the O-rings compared to the thinner silicone tape, and the polycarbonate material of the plate that doesn't resonate as much as aluminium. As for the typing feel though, the excessive plate movement and flex got a bit out of hand for my taste, but for those who like flexy plates, this combination of thin foam, O-rings around the screws and polycarbonate plate would be the perfect recipe. One other side effect of the fully transparent Everglide Aqua King switches and polycarbonate plate was the amount of RGB light coming through to the surface. With the crazy bright LEDs from this PCB, the glow under the keycaps was borderline blinding, to the point I had to reduce the brightness through via. So that would be another positive aspect of the polycarbonate plate to some of you. All right. So what are my conclusions about the Zenist Element 75 XT? The extended 75% layout of the Element 75 XT is obviously the star of the show here and possibly the main reason to get this board. Having an extra left column with five keys that you can assign macros or any other functions in multiple layers through VIA is one of those things you don't know you want until you experience it. Its potential uses for productivity and gaming are endless. And the fact this keyboard is no larger than a TKL means that even with the extra keys when compared to a regular 75%, it 
it is not an oversized board that will take too much space in your desk. I would even say that after typing on this thing for over a month now, this might be the best and most useful layout I have ever tried to date, since having programmable keys on both sides of the board is far more useful to my workflow than having a big navigation or number cluster on only one side like full-size TKL and 96% keyboards. If for nothing else, this means less intrusion on the right side, where I have my mouse. The fact I get even more keys on the top right corner when compared to the regular exploded 75% layout means I have even more options to put the navigation keys I actually use over there, which is great. And finally, having the ability to reconfigure everything in this keyboard, including the rotary encoder that can do much more than just audio volume through VIA and its dead simple interface, it's just perfect. Looks are always subjective, of course. And here we have a quite simple and unassuming design. It's a heavy rectangle and a wedge with mostly straight lines and no RGB accents. And I'm perfectly happy with that. I love the higher profile that hides the switches, the position of the USB port that is protected from any handling accidents, the proportional layout, and the slightly retro vibes of the macro left column. While I don't particularly care too much for the decorative plates on the bottom, it is still a nice touch, I guess. Would I love to see it in different colors? Sure, but I understand the challenges of coming out with a first keyboard design like this and the sacrifices that have to be made. So if you have to release it in a single color, black is the obvious choice. But I truly hope this project succeeds so we can see future rounds of this board with different case colors. While this keyboard is an improvement in almost every way when compared to the two most popular production boards with 75% layout in the last year or so, the JMMK Pro and the Keychron Q1, the typing feel is not too different from those two. As a gasket-mounted keyboard, the plate PCB assembly feels properly isolated from the case, thus producing no noticeable vibrations and unpleasant noises. And in that regard, it resembles the GMMK Pro that felt solid to type on with no weird noises and surpasses the Keychron Q1 that felt softer and nice, but unfortunately didn't sound that good. So it is fair to say that the gasket mounting used here is working fine, and I'm perfectly happy with it in its stock form with the aluminum plate. Now, with the aluminum plate, you're not going to get much plate flex or bounce, which is fine by me and should be fine for the vast majority of mechanical keyboard users out there. While I did not have the opportunity to try the FR4 plate that Zenas plans to include in the box, I would strongly suggest anyone who likes a bit more plate flex to go with that option, since FR4 plates are always more flexible than aluminum and should provide a better typing experience for those users. At any rate, as we could see in the mod chapter, it is perfectly possible to make this keyboard a bit more flexy as long as you use a thinner case foam and or rings between the case halves. Especially if Zenith reconsiders the option of also offering a polycarbonate plate, which was fairly flexy when used in conjunction with those mods. While the stock aluminum plate gives a more stable deck and the FR4 is likely to be the more balanced option in terms of flex, the polycarbonate option would unquestionably be the perfect choice for people who want lots of plate flex on their keyboard. In the sound department, I was again pretty happy with the stock performance of the Element 75 XT for its price. While there was a slight spacebar pain with the stock aluminum plate, taping the bottom case mostly took care of that, so it is not a deal breaker for me. Using the thinner foam in conjunction with the case taping in the Force Break mod did change the sound as one would expect. The overall sound got sharper and the bottom mounts more defined with the extra space for the typing kinetic energy to resonate under the PCB. Although my favorite sound profile was with the polycarbonate plate, which had a lower overall sound volume, but gave much lower frequency sounds from both Gateron Oil King and Everglide Aqua King linear switches. While Zenas did not send me a prototype FR4 plate to try with the Element 75 XT, I know from experience that FR4 plates usually don't sound much better than aluminum ones, despite feeling a bit nicer to type on in my opinion. It would be a bit of a shame not having the option to at least order a polycarbonate plate as an optional purchase for those who, like me, prefer a quieter but thockier and bassier sound profile. So I can only hope that the project runner can at least consider that possibility. While it is difficult to predict the overall quality of the final product in this case, since I was sent a heavily manhandled pre-production prototype, I can say that at least the materials used were of very good quality, and the heavy aluminum case and its black anodization is on par with what you'd get on a GMMK Pro, for example, which is good and in line with the price target of this board. Now, while my sample had a few glaring issues, such as poorly planned JST cable placements, lack of properly sized gaskets and a rather small volume knob, 
These are all things that are obviously easy to address in the final production run, and which ZenS has already confirmed to be fixed for the final product. The PCB has some of the brightest LEDs I've ever seen in a keyboard, and more importantly, it is QMK and VIA compatible, so no complaints here. As for the bottom elements plates, would an actual brass weight be more practical to increase the bottom case's weight and improve sound? Sure, but considering the price target of this board, I can't really blame the designer for this choice. So the question then is, considering its target price of roughly 310 US dollars at the time this video is being produced, is this a good deal? Well, considering that Zenes plans to sell this as an assembled keyboard with JWIG switches and PPT keycaps, plus an extra FR4 plate in the box, I'd say yeah, $310 plus shipping is actually decently competitive considering all the Element 75 XT features and when compared to what you would pay to outfit, say, a GM and K Pro with equivalent switches, FR4 plate, and keycaps, for example. This is a pretty unique layout and it could end up being a fairly small batch production run if the crowdfunding campaign doesn't blow past the minimum quantity of 200 units that Zenest has targeted. With those factors in mind, I don't think the pricing here is unreasonable. And considering the uniqueness of the layout and its price point, I can't think of many alternatives in the market at this point outside of other group by keyboards that are pretty difficult to pin down their pricing and availability. Now, if the macro column thing is not super enticing to you, then yeah, you'd have an unlimited list of other exploded 75% keyboards out there, from as low as $85 all the way to multiple hundreds for custom options that are constantly popping out of group buys everywhere. And let's not forget that you can always add macros to your current setup just by adding a programmable numpad or macro pad. For as low as $80 or $90 for a Razer Tartarus V2 or a Keychron Q0, passing by a GMMK numpad for $130, all the way to 150 for a stream deck, there are no shortage of programmable pads out there that you could use to scratch your macros itches. Regardless, I still think the target market for the Zenest Element 75 XT has the potential to be pretty wide, since the 75% layout has already proved to be the most popular recently, and considering that the addition of the macro column is something most people using keyboards for gaming and productivity could take advantage of. Also, it is always good to remind folks out there that group buys and crowdfunding campaigns are not for everybody. It is not unusual for these campaigns to take months or even years to ship. So you should be 100% aware of that and manage your expectations accordingly. But considering the small batch nature of this project, if you want a keyboard with this feature set, you might not have a better option available out there other than joining a Kickstarter campaign like this. And as is the case with any group buy or crowdfunded product launch, there are risks involved, since as a backer, you will be financing the production run by paying its full price in advance. I know people already settled on this hobby like to normalize the idea of paying exorbitant amounts of money for keyboard products in advance and then waiting months and years before you actually get your hands on them. But I'm not going to do that here. So I will remind you that group buys and crowdfunded keyboards should never be your first choice if you're just getting started in this hobby. You should only join these types of campaigns if you already have a good daily driver keyboard that can serve you well for the time you have to wait for your next custom board to be produced and shipped. The market for quality semi-custom keyboards is now large enough that you have lots of good options for production mechanical keyboards that you can buy right now from existing inventory and receive within days of your purchase. Having said that, it is a fact that most innovations in the keyboards market we've seen in the last few years mostly come from group buys and crowdfunding campaigns. Even many recognizable names in the still young industry of custom and semi-custom keyboards had their beginnings in group buys and crowdfunding campaigns, such as Keychron, just to name one of the most recognizable brands. So as you go down in your custom keyboards journey, it is a fact of life that at some point, you have to learn to deal with these upfront funded ways of buying products. All right, as usual, if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below or in my IOSAM subreddit, and I'll be happy to help you. I'll leave a link for Zenest's website and social links below and to the Element 75 XT Kickstarter campaign as soon as it goes live in the next few days. Meanwhile, if you want to check out my project to transform a $99 production keyboard into a nifty little typing beast, click here. Or click here to see my recent review of Gloria's new wireless programmable numpad. Thanks for watching and see you all soon.